Hello and welcome to Distillations, weekly extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. We're still on a much needed vacation, so this week it's part two of the best of this year's distillations. We'll revisit a story about uncovering forgeries at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and we'll listen back to an essay on the sonorous sounds of snoring. That's all coming up on today's episode of Distillations. First up today, a look back at our Valentine's show on chemical romance. We started that episode with an examination of free radicals, those unpaired electrons that can't seem to find a mate. Daria Paniches explains in this edition of The Chemical Agent. Free radicals are atoms or molecules that have an unpaired electron. The lone electron flits about looking for a companion, and the constant movement makes free radicals highly reactive. The unpaired electron will try to join with almost any other electron it can find, often with explosive results. Scientists have harnessed the free radical's high energy to set off many well-known reactions, including combustion and polymerization. But lately, free radicals have been getting a lot of negative attention for their damaging effects on the environment. When chlorofluorocarbons ascend into the Earth's upper atmosphere, the sun's ultraviolet rays cause their chlorine atoms to break off. Chlorine, a free radical, then reacts with ozone to create oxygen. The chain reaction catalyzed by one chlorine atom can destroy thousands of ozone molecules, weakening the Earth's best protector against ultraviolet rays. Free radicals also pose a number of health risks. Cigarette smoke contains the free radical nitrous oxide, which sets off a chain reaction that creates even more free radicals. This can damage the body's proteins, even DNA. The reaction eventually ends up producing more nitrous oxide, creating a vicious cycle of toxic molecules that continuously propagate, react, and ravage your body's molecules and cells. Because lone electrons are so reactive, the only way to stop a free radical's domino effect is for it to bond to something that will form a stable non-radical. Enter antioxidants. These wonder molecules, found in many fruits and vegetables, are free radical prowlers. They pounce on the lone electron at the bar, buy her a drink, and create a stable, damage-free compound. And that's it for The Chemical Agent. I'm Daria Paniches. Daria Paniches is CHF's Web Communications Manager. This piece originally aired in February. Next up, we have this story from our Faking It show. In that program, we explored how chemistry can be used to distinguish the true from the truly fraudulent. This is especially important in museums that depend on the authenticity of their art to maintain their reputations. Producer Rebecca Shear has this story from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Take a tour of the 400,000 plus items at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and you'll see works spanning thousands of years. Now we're entering the Egyptian gallery from our Art of the Ancient World department. In all media. These are Chinese ceramics. This one's inlaid with some ivory. We've got some different enamels here. From around the globe. This is our Arts of Africa gallery. You see we have a wide variety of masks. But one of the most impressive things about the MFA is what you don't see. You'll never see a TV show about us. You probably won't read a novel about us, but we are here. Richard Newman heads the MFA's Scientific Research Laboratory, one of about a dozen such labs in the country. Located several floors above the galleries, its fluorescent-lit rooms are crammed with books, PCs, and buzzing, humming machines. The lab aids curators with research, assists with conservation and restoration, and every now and again investigates authenticity. I think the closest analogy to what our laboratory does would be a CSI type lab that you see on any number of the CSI programs on all kinds of television stations. They have a laboratory, they take these little samples from crime scenes. Then they identify the materials in those samples and puzzle out who done it. Newman's lab, on the other hand, doesn't determine who done it, but when. We look largely at materials. We'll see if those materials are appropriate for the period of time that the object is purported to have come from. And if so, everything lines up, you might have the object you think you have. Sometimes it's an object already in the collection, and new information has cast doubt about its authenticity. Other times it's a candidate for acquisition, so the MFA wants to make sure it's legit. Either way, just like the guys on CSI, Richard Newman's got tools. Things like gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, electron microscopy, IR, Raman, those are very common forensic techniques as well as used in other fields. All these techniques identify a material through its chemical elements and bonds. The Raman microscope Newman mentioned uses a laser to discern bonds. 
IR, or infrared, uses electromagnetic radiation. The others detect elements. Electron microscopy magnifies them, and chromatography, well, let's let Richard Newman explain. This is what's called a liquid chromatograph. This just has a pump on it, pumping liquid through it at a very constant rate, and it's the pump that's making all these little clicking sounds, and then there's this thing that's pulling gases out of the air that's making a little gurgling sound. This particular liquid chromatograph separates, identifies, and quantifies chemical compounds found in dyes. So let's say you've got a sample of fiber, from a textile perhaps, or one of those African masks, and it's been dyed green. And it has a yellow dye and a blue dye in it, and you want to know what both of them are. So you strip off the dye, put it in solution. And you stick your sample in the stream of liquid that's always moving through the instrument. It's carried to a column. This metal tube filled with a solid material that's inert or resistant to change. In this case, it's right behind here. And since some molecules are more attracted to the liquid than others to the solid, your compound that's blue comes out at one time, and a little later or earlier, your yellow compound comes out. Newman's run so many tests on the chromatograph that he's got a database of dyes, including their historical period and retention time, or how fast they move through the column. By matching your dye's retention times with those in the database, comparing your yellow with other yellows, your blue with other blues, you can determine what those dyes are and how far back they date. So if somebody brings us something that's supposed to be a 15th century textile, we can look at the dyes with this equipment, and we can determine whether the right dyes are there or not. But there are some things the lab can't determine, at least not for sure anyway. We can rarely say that something's authentic. We could say in the best of circumstances that something is not authentic if there's improper materials that are present, but smart forgers and fakers will do their best to present something even with original materials. That's why Newman says even more sophisticated tools and techniques are needed. In the meantime, when an object's authenticity is called into question, he and his colleagues use what they can to puzzle out what they can. The hope being, of course, that with enough care and chemistry, all questions will be put to rest. For Distillations, I'm Rebecca Shear in Boston. Rebecca Shear is a reporter with public radio station KTOO-FM in Juneau, Alaska. This piece debuted in December. Want to tell us about your favorite episode from the past year? Send your thoughts to distillations at chemheritage.org. You're listening to the best of distillations. I'm Mayor Rindy. Finally today, we return to our show on sleep, which aired back in October. In this episode, we look back at the history of snoring. Snoring was originally designed by nature to keep predators at bay. Now it only serves to disrupt our bedfellows. Bob Kenworthy has the noisy details in this mystery solved. Physiologically, the reason we snore is easy to explain. When we lay our weary heads down at night and give control of our muscles over to gravity, our airways can get constricted by our tongues, which slide back into our throats. If you have allergies or a cold, like to drink alcohol or tend to sleep on your back with your mouth open, a snore fest ensues. The treatment of snoring has probably been around since 450 BC when Dionysus, god of wine, was rumored to startle those around him with his cacophonous nose music. Since then, many contraptions have been invented to regulate nasal airflow, including nose straps, nasal clips, and mouth guards. Today, there's even a pressurized mask available which pumps air through your throat all night long. Supposedly, becoming a professional singer or learning to play the didgeridoo can strengthen your windpipe muscles and help keep them wide open during sleep. For the less musically inclined, surgery is available to cut away the obstructing mouth tissue. But for many, The greatest hope to stop snoring lies in pharmaceuticals. Methyl sulfonyl methane, widely marketed as MSM, or organic sulfur, is sold as nose drops or throat spray alongside conventional decongestants and nasal corticosteroid sprays. But it's not proven to be effective against regular snoring. However, if you suffer from sleep apnea, a breathing disorder that leads to loud snoring, chemistry may yet come to the rescue. People with sleep apnea repeatedly stop breathing throughout the night. Every time this happens, a signal is sent to the carotid body, an oxygen-sensing tissue in the neck, 
which raises the blood pressure. This is useful in isolated instances, but when it happens repeatedly, the blood pressure surges, causing a high number of heart attacks and strokes. Scientists are investigating whether free radical scavengers might counter this effect. If so, then antioxidant vitamin supplements could help keep snorers' hearts healthy. But they will do nothing to stop the snoring, nor provide relief for the sleepless bedmates. Mystery not yet solved. In the meantime, the earplug industry is alive and well. I'm Bob Kenworthy. Bob Kenworthy is CHF's Manager of Affiliate Relations. And that's it for this week's Best Of episode of Distillations. We'll be back with new shows in two weeks. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Mia Lobel is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Victoria Indeviro. And our assistant producer is Jennifer Dionisio. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from the Podsafe Music Network. Check it out at music.podshow.com. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. <laughs>